Okay, photometrics. I, I have this on a black background. I, I, I hope you can see it on this white background. I, I put up photometrics of two lights. A lot of people don't understand this kind of a photometric, and, and there's a couple kinds. This is pretty common for spotlights. <coughs> this is normally the way spotlights are, are done. <coughs> And you'll notice we have a C0, a C45, and a C90. And what that means is they're going to stick the light straight up in the air. And then they're going to go around the light and measure the light output going around in a circle. And then they're either going to rotate the light 45 degrees or they're going to rotate this arm 45 degrees. And then they're going to go around and do it again. And then they're going to rotate it a full 90 degrees, and they're going to go around and do it again. Some people say, I don't understand what that means. OK, so for you to help, to help you understand what I want you to think of is the light is in the very center of this diagram. You know, if it was a, a, one of our traditional uh, brass path lights, it would just be a circle around here, right? You're going to get light coming out all sides. We'll pretend that the light's here, and this is a person, and he's going to walk around the light. Well, when you're behind the light, you don't see any light. There's no output. And when you walk around and look straight into the light, you're getting the maximum output. We, we use photometrics to actually quantify what the beam angle is on a light. And the typical way of doing that is they're going to look at the maximum the maximum intensity of the light, and they're going to say, well, where's 50% of it? And they're going to go down to 50% on either side, and they're going to say, okay, how many degrees wide is that? So in the case of this one, this is approximately 40 degrees wide. You know, we come down to in this area here, and we're getting to about 40 degrees. Here's our 12 degree optic, and as you can see, it's, it's very narrow compared to this. Our 60 degree optic is a little bit wider. These are normalized, and by that, what I, what I mean is, I have tried to make these take up pretty much all of the circle so that you can see the patterns. The reality is, when you take a 12 degree, the intensity, the light intensity, that 12 degree, is really much, much more intense because all the energy is focused in one place. If I, if I put these on the same scale, you'd find that this one only probably comes about to here compared to that. The light intensity is much, much brighter. But the light is spread much wider here. So it depends what it is you're trying to light and what kind of optics you have. We, we, we have some other lights that are um, specialty lights that have kind of funny looking optics. And that's because, well, they, they shoot light forward and out there, but nothing beneath them and stuff. So if you looked at some of our photometrics and you're saying, I, I don't understand, remember, they will typically run a circle around the light one way, and then they'll rotate it and run the circle around the light the other way. And you can look at the differences. So when you see two distinct patterns, these are our spotlights. And as you can see, it doesn't matter how we rotate them. Those lines track each other. Those lines track each other. So it really doesn't matter if the light's like this, 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 or this on our spotlights. There's nothing asymmetrical about them. They're very much, they have symmetry throughout the beam. OK, this is, a, this is an area where we talk about light and light characteristics. As I said before, please feel free to discuss. I'm going to talk about some things. If, if you don't understand or want to ask questions, please feel free at this point. OK, what is light? Does anyone here know what light is? I mean, it's something we see with our eyes. We, we, we take it for granted. But what is it? Well, it's electromagnetic radiation. It's no different than your FM radio signal your television signal, your radar signal, the, speed, the traffic cop with the speed gun, it's all electromagnetic radiation. 
The thing about light is, is it falls in a certain band. And our eyes, actually, the way I look at it is this. Our eyes are simply a very fine-tuned radio frequency receiver. That's all they are. We're actually, it's like, you, instead of listening to the FM radio, you're, you're seeing the signal. You're seeing them directly. And you're seeing the variations in the frequency is what the color variation is. A lot of times, we, we, we talk about wattages and things like that to try to convey how much light comes out of a fixture and what's the proper size light to use. Well, there's a way we can quantify it and it's kind of fair grounds to quantify things with and it's called what's the lumen output of the light? You know, that's the amount of light actually exiting the fixture. How many lumens come out of the light? How do we quantify brightness? There's a number of different metrics we can use to quantify brightness, but two of the most common are going to be called lux and foot candles. And lux is in the metric system, and foot candles is in the British system, basically. But both of them use the same thing. How many lumens per square meter, or how many lumens per square foot? If you're dealing with commercial businesses, people will, will give you requirements. I need X number of lux or X number of foot candles to be present on this surface, on this floor, whatever. Uh, you know, a perfect example is if you look at uh, the requirements for Bank of America and lighting up the, uh, the ATMs. Well, we need 10 foot candles on the wall there at the ATM. And within so many feet of it, it can only reduce to so many foot candles. So if you're in, in the commercial business, if you're looking at commercial installs, you need to understand what a lux is and a foot candle is. And because the only difference between these things is one's a square meter and the other's a square foot, a quick rule of thumb is there's a 10 to 1 ratio between them. It's pretty close, it's not ex exact, but most people, if you say, hey, I need two lux, and if you turn around and say, oh, okay, you need 20 foot candles, all of a sudden it looks like you, you know the difference between them and you know what you're talking about. So for those of you who are entertaining commercial business, I, I think you need to be able to converse lux foot candles just be able to do the conversion between the two in your head. It's a factor of 10. Most of us can do that. It, it gives you an edge up. Let's them know you know what you're talking about. Now, illumination. You know, illumination doesn't come from a light. Illumination comes from a light. Most of what we do at Garden Light and most of what you've the dealers do at their installations is they create illumination. Illumination is when the light is reflected off of a surface. And all the effects you're really trying to get when you're, you're lighting a house, a residence, a, a commercial building, really the effect is the illumination. Okay. We're going to talk real quickly about the human eye. As I said, it's kind of a finely tuned uh, electromagnetic wave re receiver. We have things in the eye, they're called rods. We have things in the eye that are called cones. The, the, uh, the cones are what give us our color vision. We have a red one. We have a blue one. We have a green one. And so when we perceive light, it's the combination of the red, the blue, and the green, the, the values coming through the optic nerve for each of those things that tell us what the color is. Obviously, there are people out there who are colorblind, OK? And they have a defect in one of these things, and it doesn't allow them to distinguish all the colors if you're missing red, if 
if you're missing blue. You know, it, it would distort your color. The rods are more of a very low light level detector. In the full sunlight, we, everything's working. But primarily, your vision is being, uh, your perception of the vision is coming from your cones. As the light level goes down in the night, it's primarily the rods that are working. You know, you, you see shades of gray, you know, contrast. That, that's what the rods do. We, we have different types of vision. If it's during the daytime, we have what's called photopic vision. We're using our, we're using everything, but primarily we're using our cones. They call this photopic vision. Full color, daytime vision. We have a thing called scotopic, and that's at night after your eyes are well adjusted. You, you, you're seeing primarily contrast, shades of gray and whatnot. That's photopic vision. If you're in darkness and there's no lights around, that's where you are. And then we have one that's kind of, it's, it's a little bit loosely defined, but it's the in-between state. It's called mesooptic vision. And quite frankly, that's where much of the work that you do is perceived as under this type of vision. You got a little bit of activity, you can still see the colors from the cones, but you're very definitely in a dimly lit uh, atmosphere. And so that's a transitional vision range between the two, and that's where most of the lighting jobs are perceived at. Uh, let's see. Okay, so back in the 30s, the 1930s, the uh, group of color scientists got together and said, how, how can we represent colors? Is there a way we can try to map out colors or explain colors or understand how you mix colors and whatnot? And they came up with this CIE color chart. And there's, I got two versions of it here. I couldn't get the the nice, beautiful chart that I have in my office. It's all nicely blended. Wasn't able to pull one of those off, so we'll have to work with this. But you're at, to, at the tour tomorrow, I'll hang up the chart and you can see it because the, the transition between all the colors, the blend is much better. So what, what they did is they mapped out this color system and they mapped it out on a X and Y chart. So they define color using an X and Y plane. This right here is where, where we call royal blue. It's on the verge of being purple. It's a little, little, it's not quite as purple as you see it there on this chart, but it's, it's royal blue. It's a very deep blue. There is some violet content to it. Up here at the top, we have green. And you might notice our eyes track with blue, green. And over here is red. So when we're looking at things with our eyes, we're trying to combine blue, red, and green to get a vision where we fall on this chart. They kind of split this chart. They have a green area, a yellow area, an orange, red. This line right here, they call it the purple line because it goes from one shade of purple to the other. But you have your royal blue, cyans, and this is really part of the green up here. Now, along the outside of this is what we call saturated colors. Saturated colors are somewhat pure colors. We can represent a saturated color both by an X and Y coordinate, or we can look at it, and as you look here, you'll see that this starts at 770 nanometers, we're up to 520 nanometers, and down to 450 nanometers. So you can always represent a saturated color by talking about what's its wavelength, the nanometers. And this is, the nanometers are the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation, what you're actually seeing. Another thing that we, uh, white light, Mixed colors show up in the center of this. These in here are non-saturated. 
and the definition of, of pure white light relative to this chart is you go to one third, one third, and it puts you right here. Now, we often talk about color temperature. So I'm going to talk to you about the black body locus. This line right here is the black body locus. It's got some other names for it. Uh, let's see. It's also called the black body curve. Also called the Planckian locus. Okay. I think Planckian locus is probably the technically correct term for it. Color temperature. Color temperature is something that is often misunderstood. So I wanted to talk briefly about it. This line right here, the black body locus, the Planckian locus, it talks about, and a black body is a, an, an imaginary thing, but doesn't truly exist except in scientific terms. But what I like to talk about is let's think about a piece of steel, just a plain old piece of steel, and let's get a blowtorch and let's start heating up that piece of steel. What's the first thing you're going to do, notice from it? After a little while, it's going to, you're going to start to kind of see a red color come out. And as it gets hotter, you know, it's going to be red. And as it gets hotter, it's going to come up here into the orangish range. And as it gets hotter, it's going to turn a little yellow. We're just tracking this line here. And then after it gets really hot, it starts turning white. And if you continue to heat it, Beyond the white point, it gets to a whitish blue. That's kind of what the black body curve is all about. It's saying, how can we quantify this color? And they do it in terms of what they call Kelvin, K-E-L-V-I-N. And Kelvin is a scale. It's a temperature measurement scale. It is the same scale as centigrade, except it's offset by I think 273 degrees. Absolute zero, which you can't quite obtain. We're getting pretty close, but you can't get there. Absolute zero is zero degrees Kelvin. So when we come up to here, you know, we're at 3,000 Kelvin, you know, which puts us right in here. The light is a little yellow, just slightly. And if we go down to 2,700 K, it becomes a little more yellow. And if we go up to, you know, sunlight, which is right here, is it 6,500 Kelvin. And if you go above it, you can get LEDs that go up to 8,000 Kelvin. When you get up to 8,000 Kelvin, the color of the white has a lot of blue content. You can actually see the blue bleeding through. Color temperature only exists on this curve. If you're off the curve, you really can't talk about color temperatures. And the fact of life is LEDs can be anywhere inside that space. So LEDs, even though we talk about color temperature, what we're really truly talking about is what we call correlated color temperature. And for this point here, let's say 3200K, there's a little line that goes through there. And anything on that line has a correlated color temperature of 3,200 degrees Kelvin. It, it's a mathematical formula. There's an infinite number of solutions. The thing that we need to be mindful of is as this curve goes like this, well, once you go above it, you become a little more yellow. And once you go below it, you become a little more red or pink. So, the idea is to try to mimic the incandescent bulbs by trying to drive our correlated color temperature so it is next to or on this line. But it is really not correct to talk about color temperature on LEDs, only correlated color temperature. <coughs> LEDs are classified by correlated color temperature, or CCT as we call it. Any questions? There's a lot. I know I crammed a lot in a short space. Um, yes? Are you all working on RGB changing lights and controls currently? 
we, we have a couple uh, concepts on the board. I, I don't, I'm not ready to introduce anything like that to you, but we, we certainly Two years, are. Three years? Uh, time frame's not dictated by me, so. As soon as I can, I'll be happy to do it. <laughs>